Thanks for listening to Uncle Sam's Soccer Podcast, keeping you up to date with the latest in American soccer. And don't forget to subscribe. Uncle Sam Soccer Podcast, welcome. Jake Watroba here in Minnesota. We got our Moncafi down in Dallas. We're doing a little impromptu episode. Uh, I think we promised we weren't going to record this week, but here we are. Yeah, uh, Jake hit me up. I was like, let's do an NBA podcast. And I was like, all right, let's do it. And now we're here doing a uh, U.S. soccer-based podcast. So uh, shows our commitment to the game of basketball yeah, yeah, we, and uh, soccer. <laughs> we hopped on Skype and started talking uh, initially about basketball. And then it just shifted to soccer. And we were both kind of just thought, why don't we just do a soccer podcast? This just seems more This just seems more of something we want to do right now than talk about basketball. Yeah, and, and I love I love what's going to NBA Finals and whatnot, and hopefully uh, I have the Cavs winning at six. Hot sports take right there. Wow. But um, yeah, let's let's jump right into it. let's talk about soccer. Well, all right, let's talk about the USA Bolivia match. Uh, the US won last night, three nil in front of a <laughs> uh, very thin <laughs> crowd in Chester, Pennsylvania. It was a game. Um, I watched it. I watched it twice. And were, the more were I watched you, it, the more... Were you what? awake during the... Uh, the <laughs> yeah, so, during, yeah okay. so um, I was awake during the first match, but um, it was kind of one of those things where I was just kind of like watching in the background, you know, it, it, just on, on my phone, reading Twitter about the latest updates in MLS and working on a couple stories here and there, and uh, just caught the game in the background. And let me tell you something, I totally mess doing that method i totally didn't catch a few things uh during the performance uh jake you watched the game what'd you make of it i mean it's it it was the bolivian c team (laughs) so i don't know if there's really much to take away from it i thought rubin Sargent, and wea uh they look really good going forward i don't know about you I did. I agree. I think Rubin's work rate was really impressive. I think he was he was going up up and down that pitch, and I thought Wea was very uh, dangerous. Uh, he wasn't getting the uh, end of things or finishing things off uh, at the beginning, but he was still creating opportunities. And I think in a friendly of that magnitude, which is almost nothing, that's something you would you would like to see. Um, going back and looking at the uh, match uh, for a second time, I thought Weston McKinney was awesome. Just the way he was connecting the defense to the midfield, I thought it was great. So it's one of those things that you cannot be bullish to what you take out of that match because, again, like you mentioned, it was Bolivia's C team. And Bolivia did not look that good. I'm watching that game for a second time, Bolivia did not press. Oh, I don't man. think they even got numbers pushing up. Dude, there was, I, I, won't... I made a comment on Twitter last night because I was live tweeting on the Uncle Sam uh, Twitter account, by the way. Go follow unk, at Unc Sam. <laughs> Uh, soccer pod. The I I I don't know how long the Bolivian side spent in the final third of the pitch, but it couldn't have been more than a few minutes. They they I, I remember just watching for a long stretch, going they haven't they haven't broken through the U.S. midfield. No, it's it was one of those things where I was watching Weston McKinney. I was like, wow, he's really jogging casually back. Uh, defensively, it's just kind of weird. And then I look, I'm like, well, that's he's fine because there's only three Bolivian f- attackers and one of them has the ball. And you're like, this is just. It, it was one of those games where I just watched back. I was like, well, this is a a little bit of a weird game to take anything out of because I mean, you see a guy like Weston McKinney, he's he's not going all the way. He doesn't have to because they're not pushing numbers up. And Bolivia defensively, I mean. I don't know what they were trying to do on the opening goal by Sargent because that was just awful defending. I don't know about you, Jake, but the goalkeeper was just... You, you mean, you, you're talking about the, the, the opening goal or the goal scored by Sargent? The opening goal scored by Sargent. Uh, that was uh, Walker Zimmerman. Oh, my bad. You're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. My bad. I don't know why I thought that was... Yeah, <laughs> the Sargent goal. That was... I watched that and I was like, wow, this is a... Uh, 
I, I don't know what to say about that goal. It was just a, a terrible pass from the goalkeeper. But let's talk about Walker Zimmerman, Jake. I mean, you, you, you totally got me onto him now. I thought he had a great game. I think that the, the entire – well, it's hard to it's hard for me to judge the back line. <laughs> yes, they barely got tested. They, got, they barely got tested. I, I think I spent – I went and got food at halftime. I think I spent more time at the in the drive-thru at the uh, Culver's I went and grabbed a cheeseburger at than the Bolivian national team spent uh, in in the attacking third of the field. Uh, it's it's really hard to judge the U.S. back line just because there's just nothing nothing happened. There was nothing threatening about the about what Bolivia did yesterday. It it, it is clear though that Walker Zimmerman is the is an aerial threat that the U.S. desperately uh, need. Though uh, I thought he. I, I thought he did very well. Obviously, on that corner, he he was able to find the back of the neck. Um, but, like I said, there's just not much you can really go off of beyond that goal. Who, in your eyes, was a player that really helped his stock in this game? Um, man, that's that's a tough question. Like I said, I think I think I mean everybody kind of played well. Uh, I would I would. I would think Josh Sargent helped his stock a bit, and I would think uh, Timothy Weah helped their st- their stock quite a bit. Sorry, I know you asked for one, but I think those two in particular. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I really like what they did, especially Weah. He seemed very dangerous on the ball too. Um, his movement was also off the ball was also uh, was he moved pretty well off the ball. Uh, he did make some questionable decisions though with passes and crosses. Um, he. he took a few errant shots too that I thought he probably shouldn't take. He he seemed like a guy that was trying too hard, maybe trying to impress, um, maybe had a, a little bit too much adrenaline flowing being that it was his first start with the national team. But I would, I would have to pencil him and, and Sargent as the, the two more uh, impressive players from yesterday's match. Yeah, for me, I would have to say Anthony Robinson, I thought was probably one of the, Better players, uh, the uh, the left the left back. I want to say so. I I, I can't remember it's for not, some reason. That's not yeah, because Lehigh was playing the right right. right yeah, back. yeah. So yeah, Rob Robinson. I thought had a really impressive game uh, going up the one. One thing I noticed was he did allow himself to get beat often, but his pace compensated for that, and he would catch up and uh, get the get the ball back or force a turnover or something like that. And, that works against a team like Bolivia, but against a better team, that might not be the best case. But I did like his assist on Wea's goal. I mean, it was almost a perfect ball onto Wea's feet. And I know at left back, USA has been struggling to find one. And I think his performance right there was like, hey, look, I can play this position, and I can play this position well. So maybe maybe give me a look. And, I mean, I'll give, I'll, I'll give you one more because uh, you you gave us one more. Sure. Uh, so I'm gonna match you. Um, I thought uh, Keaton Parks played well in, in his performance, but I'm I'm kind of I'm interested by a dynamic between him and Weston McKinney because I feel like they're both the same player in a really in, in the U.S. system, uh, at least being both box to box mids because Parks pushed up high like really high, and I was really really surprised at some points and then you see McKinney push up high but they both do the same job connecting the defense to the midfield so I'm interested to see how that's going to work because they're either going to be competitors or they're going to be uh, complementary pieces to each other so I want to see that dynamic so, uh, we got, we, <clears throat> I got a comment on Twitter last night um, from somebody basically stating that they thought Weston McKinney should have been playing up higher um in that maybe they maybe maybe McKinney should have been playing just uh, in front of the back line there, uh, it, it should have swapped with uh, Corona there in the midfield. Um, so maybe that's something you see in the future with maybe Keaton Parks, you know, playing in front of the the the, the back line or vice versa with um, McKinney and the other one playing up a little bit higher. So I think I think they can play together though. They may be a yeah, little redundant, I mean- but I I don't think. I don't know if that's necessarily a bad thing. It's it's nice to have depth too. I mean, yeah, it instead is. Instead of and, trying and out I, Kyle Beckerman there. <laughs> yeah, and I mean, their ability to be interchangeable provides fluidity in the lineup. So I think that's uh, a, a cool thing that you know you you won't be stuck if like let's say Parks pushes up higher 
and then McKinney stays back or vice versa. So if it's more of like a situational thing. You know, one of them receives a the ball higher up the pitch, all right, the other one's going to stay back. I think that's that's something that's going to be really uh, interesting for the new manager to play with in the future. So, I mean, it was, I thought, uh, a fun game to watch. But, I mean, it's one of those games that it had no meaning and it had – no uh like implications i guess maybe that's why it's more fun of a game to watch and sure i I think you'll definitely learn a lot more about this young u.s side um over the next week when they face off against ireland and then france but one thing we did learn today is that there's a new club coming to mls starting in 2019 what what club is that, man? That, that I have would, no idea. That, whatever do you mean? Uh, yeah, FC Cincinnati was announced today by Don Garber. Uh, they will be they'll be playing in 2019. We we have we are now up to 26 clubs. We now have an even number of clubs too in MLS. So no no more of this wonky, weird, odd number of teams where five teams have the, the week off or whatever. What what do, what are your takeaways on that? What what do you what do you think about the FC Cincinnati starting next year. It's it was I thought it was expected. I mean, I think we talked about this. Uh, I would say almost a year, like I guess around a year ago or something like that. With with Cincinnati coming up, it's one of those teams that you would think they're almost expected to play in 2019. Nashville, I mean, do they really have a place to play? Uh, Miami, I mean, we don't know. So the next team that was going to come in, I think, was the team that needed to be ready to play now. And, excuse me, uh, Cincinnati is ready to play now. I mean, Nipper is, i say, a fine stadium to play at. I mean, they use it for the Open Cup, and they had 32,000 at the Open Cup match against the, the Red Bulls. Um, so they, they're able to play there. Um, they, they've they almost established, like, a USL, uh, an NASL former player all-star team with the players that they've signed. Uh, I know some of them will transition into MLS. I'm sorry, I did the, uh, there's a couple players on that roster that should be in MLS, and then they'll be looking to attract uh, big name big name players. I think it's a great addition by MLS, especially you know they look like they've been growing year in year out. And the crazy thing is, they're they were only an idea a few years back. They only came to existence three years ago which I find amazing that the fans have come behind this team so much that they've basically forced their way into an MLS expansion spot. Yeah, I agree. It, 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 this whole process, though, with with them being announced today just seems so drawn out. Like you said, it, it feels like it's been a year since we've, <laughs> we've kind of known that FC Cincinnati was going to get a team. It, it just made the most sense. They're drawing crowds of 20,000 people, in, or 20,000 plus, I, I, I think... Uh, in that U.S. Open Cup match against was it Chicago Fire, they had I think they sold out Nippert Field or Stadium or whatever it's called. I think they had over forty thousand people there, and it it it, it feels right. It, it I'm glad that FC Cincinnati got it over uh, a side like Detroit, who doesn't really seem to have their you know what together. You know, trying to force their way into playing in Ford Field. We'll get to that in a little bit, by the way. Um, but no, it, it just feels right, and we can talk about this here in a little bit, but I, I wonder what it means for Columbus Crew, if this is kind of the final nail in the coffin that MLS is able to get out of a smaller market in Ohio and into a bigger market all at the same time. I'm assuming Cincinnati's a bigger market than Columbus. I could be wrong, actually. But um, no, I, I, it's... It's a uh, it's a good move. I know you had some stuff you wanted to read about uh, Don Garber's announcement. Yeah, and before I, yeah before I get to that, I'm not sure what that means for Columbus. Uh, just briefly, because Don Garber likes his rivalries. I mean, we know it: LAFC, LA Galaxy, Red Bull, NYC, Atlanta, Orlando that they're trying to push, and then Nashville being added into that mix. They love that Portland Seattle rivalry. Don't forget the best rivalry in MLS: uh, Minnesota United and. <laughs> No, you're right. You're right. He does like. They do. He like likes him. Rivalry week. Ugh. Is that still a thing? Yeah, Heineken rivalry week. He, yeah. he, he loves. He loves that. So you can't really look into. I don't think you can really look into this and be like. So is this the end of Columbus? Because at the same time, you know, Garber wants to push for those rivalries, 
And, you know, if they get the right offer, they'll stay. But my thing is, I think that the more, and we'll get to it later, the more quiet it is with uh, Austin, I think the more likely it is to happen. So uh, that's just my thought. But Garber did say something interesting that I'm going to read. It's from Pat Brennan. Um, he is a, a writer in the, in the Cincinnati area. Uh, his Twitter is at pbrennanenq. And I'll just read to you what, he's, what Don Garber said about the next round of expansion because I want to get to this point uh, because I think I know where MLS wants to expand next. Um, they asked, what's the next round of expansion going to look like? Do you have any details on that? said, no specific details on the event or even the time of the next round. What I'll say is we started with 12. Now we're down to a handful of markets where we are still on, having ongoing discussions. You mentioned Sacramento, Detroit with Ford Field, uh, San Diego. And then he mentions Las Vegas that has a thriving USL team and their mayor reached out to them very recently. And San Antonio is on their list too. So they have a bunch of interest here and there. I think MLS wants to move into San Antonio next. As or, or, Excuse me. See, I messed it up. <laughs> they want to move into Las Vegas next because we're, I, I, we've been look, we've been looking around. They're now Sports Town with the Golden Knights and yeah, the, the Golden Raiders. Knights have have an incredible atmosphere. Uh, I don't know if you watched uh, the Stanley Cup yesterday, Jake, but I did in between the game in between Game Seven, and I thought it was a great atmosphere, having a lot of fun. The team has really came behind uh, the Knights, and also the Raiders are going there too. I think. NBA even mentioned, or one of the major sports teams mentioned that Las Vegas might be another place they expand to. I think Major League Soccer is going to hop on that trend before everyone else, and they're going to move into Las Vegas uh, real soon. I don't know if they'll play in a stadium. Maybe they'll ground share with uh, the Raiders. But I think MLS is really eyeing that Las Vegas market, and they're seeing everything. And they're going to come up and knock off one of these teams. And I if you're if you're another team, you're gonna be probably upset that you're gonna be spited. But I think MLS is making the right move by going into this Las Vegas market, which has emerged almost out of nothing, right? Everyone was making fun of hockey being in the desert of Las Vegas, but now it's everyone's gone behind the team. I, I actually thought the move. And this is kind of a going a little bit of tangent here. I thought the move NHL's move to Las Vegas was brilliant at the time, and I, it just it just makes much sense because think of how much easier tickets are to sell. When you're in Las Vegas, think of how much easier you're going to have away crowds now. If if MLS chooses to go to uh, to Las Vegas, think how much easier it is to get uh, an away fan to want to go there. You know, it, it's it's Vegas. Who doesn't want to go to Vegas? Yeah, it's um, it's it's a great it's a great place to go to for like you know fun. I think the one thing people were worried about was just how would you attract like the people that actually live there, and. It's it's a really interesting dynamic because he mentions Las Vegas. He mentions Las Vegas. I think it's huge. Uh, were there even a team that was in consideration? No, I don't think so. Does so. this give you like a weird Cincinnati vibe? Not in terms of like the fans, but like I don't think Cincinnati was mentioned like years years back of being a team that was that MLS wants to expand into. Well, like you said, FC Cincinnati has only been a in existence since 2016. I, I think exactly. the, the, what drove MLS to Cincinnati was the crowds and the fact that people showed up and seemed to care. Yeah, and, and that looks like that's what's happening in, in Vegas now with the Vegas lights. Is that what we're, is that what we're calling them? Yeah, the Vegas lights. Mm-hmm. So it makes sense. And you definitely want to get, if you're going to expand to Vegas, it looks like other leagues are doing that too. You want to get in there early. You don't want to be with the last... Exactly. You, you want, want to get want, there. You want to be yeah, a last. You want to be there in. early. Yeah. Exactly. You want. You want. You want to be early. Uh, I'm just trying to see when the Raiders are moving into. Uh, it's next, it's ne- this is their final year in Oakland. All right. They'll yeah. Play so at UNLV for a year or two, and that new, that stadium should be opened up. Yeah. So I mean that, that makes it what like around 2020, 2021. Yeah. So I mean I think that almost lines up. That almost winds up coinciding with uh, MLS and their and their window. What. We're adding, we're becoming 26 in, 20, uh, in 2020. So if that's the case, 2021, 2022, add two more teams that way. I think Las Vegas is the team that is the area. I mean, I'm telling you, you got to look at the Golden Knights' success. They're, that's not, if that continues, MLS is going to be keying in on that Las Vegas market because they'll beat NBA, they'll beat MLB, they'll beat, um, I'm, missing, I'm missing a market, am I? I'm missing, am I missing a league? 
Uh, well, I the think NFL so is NFL's moving there to next yeah. year. Yes. And, and, and the other thing, too, is the W. I just remember the WNBA just moved the the San Antonio Stars. Is that who they moved to, yeah, I guess? Yeah, Silver Stars. Yeah. You would know. You're down in Texas. Yeah. yeah so, I don't know how they're doing out in Vegas, but uh, that's another franchise to watch and, and see how Vegas does supporting a a professional top tier uh, franchise. I mean, I mean that's just my uh, assumption. I just genuinely believe that they'll, that they'll move to Vegas and the other teams. Sacramento, I they they've been good with their attendance, but on a lesser scale. They ha- they're ready to go in terms of infrastructure. I just I, I they've had problems with their uh with their with their groups. But do you, I mean, do you think Sacramento is a lock? Yeah, if you would have asked me that two years ago, a year ago, I would have said yes. Today, I, I don't. I don't think so. I, to me, it's like I just look at these markets and just think, what's so appealing about what's what makes Sacramento more appealing than a market like Detroit? That's a much larger market um, that you're able to get a, a bigger chunk of TV revenue. Um, that you're probably going to be able to draw more fans because you, you potentially could be playing in a NFL stadium. What what makes Sacramento more attractive than Detroit? Well, do you think they have to choose between uh, Sacramento, Las Vegas, and San Diego, right? With San Diego, I mean, what about Phoenix? Where is San where's Diego? Phoenix? San Diego's mentioned or Phoenix? I don't think you added like what three Western Conference teams or like two Western Conference teams uh, for twenty seven, twenty eight. I think you add. I think you only had one Western Conference team, and you probably had another Eastern Conference team. I mean, San Diego's is casually mentioned there. Or uh, yeah, San Diego's is mentioned there. Uh, uh, Foodie McFoodie I, face. Yeah, Foodie McFoodie face. I don't think they're even gonna be taken seriously. To be honest with you, I think their bid's been dead. Detroit in that four field bid, it drives me crazy because they had a plan to build a stadium. They're like, no, nah, we're just gonna go in, into Ford Field. Which you look at Atlanta's success, and you're like, okay, maybe that'll work. But if it doesn't work, it looks terrible. Yeah, and I can totally see why uh, why a team like Detroit would want to just play in an NFL stadium. Just because, like you said, because Atlanta's been so successful, and you can you can generate more revenue playing in an NFL stadium if you get thirty thousand people there, forty thousand people there, than you would if you built your own stadium of twenty thousand people, and I don't know. It just it MLS set a weird precedent when they allowed Atlanta to play at the uh, at the Benz. Is that is that what we're calling it? The Benz. Yeah, the Benz. <laughs> <laughs> they set a very weird precedent for these expansion teams because why is it okay for Atlanta to play in an NFL stadium, um, but it's not okay for Detroit? Exactly. It's it's a really weird precedent that they set. Um, but out of these markets, Jake, which one, if you're Don Garber, which, so I'm going to mention the markets one more time for our listeners, Sacramento, Detroit, San Diego, Las Vegas, San Antonio, were all mentioned by name by Don Garber. Jake, if you're Don Garber, who do you try to pursue for 27-28? Vegas at the, is at the top of my list. And, who second franchise, hmm. I know I just argued that Detroit makes the most sense in terms of TV revenue, but I would, I guess I would, I, 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 I could just see Sacramento just being a better atmosphere, just having a more um, authentic soccer experience for uh, people at the game, people watching on TV. Uh, I, I could definitely see them kind of, kind of being like those crowds in Portland or Seattle, just raucous show up for every game, really into the match. And I, I think MLS needs more of more clubs like that who are gonna draw a solid, you know, twenty thousand people if that's I'm assuming Sacramento has to build a new stadium or expand their current one. Um just a just a a, a franchise that can draw twenty thousand people and it's just a raucous atmosphere versus clubs like Chicago or New England or Red Bull that just don't draw anybody and it's just kind of a flat in dead environment. I agree. I think Las Vegas is at the top of MLS. If I'm Dom Garber, at the top of my list, at least I go and pursue that immediately and try to get in before some of the other uh, franchises 
do. And one of the teams that intrigues me is San Antonio. I mean, maybe it's partly it's because I'm from here. And I also will be going to San Antonio next week for uh, some Open Cup action. So oh, I, will check out their, I will check out their stadium <laughs> um, because I think that's part of it. I think they want to expand that stadium. They have an infrastructure, right? They just want to expand it. Um, and they're owned by the, San, the Spurs organization. So, I mean, that's a stable ownership right there. My question is, do you want to add another team in Texas, especially if Austin comes in? That's four teams in Texas. That's, that's, and, that's a great segue. That's, 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 I think that's a little too much. So segue, segue, do it. <laughs> you mentioned San Antonio potentially getting a team, but how would that happen if the Columbus crew moved to Austin? How was that first segue? <laughs> I think it's a pretty brilliant segue, Jake. I don't know about you, man. You've been on a roll. You were on a roll with the the Twitter last night. We we're getting plenty of interactions, and now you're on a roll with these segues too. We should just fire Stephen and keep you in here. Yeah, hey, um, yeah. Let let me know. I'm I'm I'm, I'm on standby. <laughs> but yeah, Austin. Let's talk about it, Jake. Uh, Kevin Little uh, from the Austin American Statesman tweeted out they spoke with USL Austin 2019 management today, and they chided him for using the phrase "plan to play" next year. Uh, GM Robert Pinto da Silva Jr. said, "We are playing. You can remove any doubt. There's no turning back now." What are your thoughts on that, Jake? Those are big words. Um, you're of the opinion that the crew are for sure moving. So, I, I think U.S. Well, not for sure. I think it's more likely than not. They have to. The USL knows something we don't know, though, right? They have to. They they have to have a better idea of what's going on with the possible relocation of the crew to Austin. That being said, I don't think the crew relocate to Austin next year. I think they're still in Columbus for the. 2019 season so i guess that would make sense why usl would want to play you think it'd be delayed i just i i just don't i don't know it it there just seems to be there, there's a lot of things that need to be worked out right now with austin i think f- to get the crew down there and granted that could change i mean you know the 2019 season doesn't start for another nine months <laughs> but it just seems like there's a lot of we've we've seen reports or and maybe they're not maybe just rumors i can't Remember, but I've, I've I've read that the University of Texas doesn't necessarily want the crew playing at uh, is it Longhorn Stadium. I'm not sure where the DKR. DKR. They're okay. We're asking. Yeah. There you go. You would know more than you'd know better than I would. <laughs> they don't want them playing there. They can't find a site to build their new stadium on because the city doesn't want them building. You know, doesn't want it build, building in some park or wherever in Austin. And I just think that the whole this if it's gonna happen, it's gonna be a little bit. It, it's gonna be drawn out. I, I I think the crew will be in Columbus next year, which makes sense that Austin's USL side would start in Austin in 2019. Are you saying that they'll ever move? I don't know. I don't know the the legal. What well, I don't know all the legalities that are going to it right now. I know that the is it, I don't know if it's the city of Columbus or the state of Ohio that, that, that's suing. Pre-court, there's some, there was some law put in place when Art Modell moved the Cleveland Browns to the to Baltimore, and I know there's there's a law that kind of makes it harder for owners to just relocate their their franchises out of the, the state of Ohio. So I think it, I think it might be delayed, maybe maybe by a year. I think I think it'll probably happen unless for some weird reason. The, something forces pre-court to not be able to move it. And in which case he either sells the, the team or just keeps him there and is just the most hated man in Ohio. For me, I'm looking at this. Uh, like I said, I think the more quiet they are, the more likely it is to be, to be done. My thing is with this Austin thing is I'm interested by this trend, uh, especially set by the Chicago uh, ownership uh, by Tom Ricketts, the owner, uh, part owner of the uh, Cubs, um, with these U- these teams coming in in USL and in, M- in already MLS markets and kind of pushing things. I would be interested to see if that becomes a trend in the future, especially with MLS cap uh, being capped at what twenty eight teams. So, for example, if maybe. Uh, someone comes in and in Dallas and makes a USL team in Dallas. How how would that work? I find it interesting. I think the more competition there is, the better. 
I think U.S. of Austin is basing it, basing their thoughts on, all right, we're not going to move, or they're not going to move. I'm sorry. So we're we're going to start, and either the the crew move, or they don't move, and we're great off, right? We have a, our team ready to go, and a lot of fans are now hungry for soccer that were kind of, uh, I don't know what's the right word for it, blue-balled. Um, wow, okay. Yeah, <laughs> that they thought they were going to get a, uh, an MLS team, and now they're going to get a uh, USL team. So I guess they'll throw their support behind the USL side. And I know the MLS for Austin supporters group, uh, when I sat down with them uh, a few months back, they said, we would love to have a USL team. We would love to have professional soccer. We don't care though how it is. I'm sure they'd prefer did, MLS. I did mean, they mention? Wouldn't? Did they mention the Austin Aztecs at all when <laughs> you, when they said? Yeah, they did. We yeah, love did. we love USL. We love <laughs> to have a pro soccer team here, but we just yeah. don't want the Austin Aztecs. Yeah, and, and they asked the Aztecs, man. It's a funny story. They were now they're in Orlando City. I think it's I think it's a crazy a cra- crazy little thing. But Jake, with this USL announcement, if there is an Austin team in there and the USL team. Do you think the USL team even has a chance of survival? No, I don't, and I think they'll. I think it's it's probably a hell of a lot easier to relocate a USL team than it is an MLS team. Where would you relocate them? I would relocate them to like El Paso. I'm surprised. Is there a USL team in El Paso? There's the uh, Rio Grande Valley uh, team from. Um... There's a baseball. There's a Triple A baseball team in El Paso. I don't think there is no Paso. I think I heard a rumor that Liga MX wants to try to move into El Paso. I mean, again, this is a random rumor I heard online. I, I'm surprised too. There's like a so much talent in that area. Well, that US still seems to be loaded. The only, the only thing out there is the University of uh, El Paso, Texas. So why not? Why? Why? I don't understand why USL hasn't moved to a, a town like that on the border on the U.S. Mexico border there. Uh, in western Texas, where well, there really isn't anything out there, you would know better than I would, obviously, but I'm pretty sure that there's nothing out, <laughs> out that way in Texas. Yeah, you're pretty right. <laughs> so it, it, it makes a ton of sense why, if, if this were to happen, if I was if I was USL Austin, I would just move, pack up and move uh, uh, a few hundred miles west to El Paso and, and set up shop there. El Paso is an interesting market that you bring up because I think it would be a market that would be incredible. That has been it for a, uh, I guess a lower division side. I think it makes so much sense. Maybe not for an MLS team just yet, but for a lower division side, I think it makes too much sense. And I think you're right. If you are a USL Austin, you would look towards El Paso and be like, okay, maybe we can maybe we can move there. But that's only if the crew move to Austin. So I mean, it's one of those things that's contingent on another. But I'm assuming these guys just don't. Don't expect um, MLS to move to Austin. But let me let me ask you this, Jake, before we go. If you're Don Garber, I know it's a lot of Don Garber, you know, pretend like we're the commissioner and whatnot, but I want to hear your take. If you're Don Garber, would you rather the team stay in Columbus or move to Austin? I think that's a question for Steven Jodran on this weekend's episode of Uncle Sam Soccer Podcast. <laughs> well, we're going to leave the suspense. I'm going to be I'm going to be very political. I think if that's the right word, uh, or neutral with that, and just not answer. Uh, <laughs> I know Stephen has some hot takes on uh, the crew versus Austin or Columbus versus Austin uh, argument um, that I think we maybe maybe we need to grill him on this weekend. Yeah, and I'll give you I'll save the listeners my uh, opinion for the weekend as well since Jake uh, wants to try to put me on the spot but you know I I didn't put you on the spot I put Steven on the spot (laughs) yeah Steven deserves to be on the spot but anyways listeners you know where to follow us at Jake say the magic letters you can follow us you can follow the show on Twitter at UncSamSoccerPod and you can follow me on Twitter at Jake Watroba you can follow Armand Kafai at Armand Kafai. Who would have thought? It's just our names. Um, yeah, follow we're geniuses. Steve, yeah, we're geniuses. Follow Stephen Jodran as well. Gone, but at, not, gone, at, but not uh, forgotten. Rigged. At, at, yeah, at Rigged FC. <laughs> um, also, I just want to say before we sign off, uh, 
Yesterday was the two-year anniversary of Harambe being, <laughs> being shot and murdered at the Cincinnati Zoo. Hey, so Cincinnati while we Zoo. celebrate Cincinnati FC, or FC Cincinnati's uh, move to MLS, let's not forget Harambe. And with that, we'll talk to you guys this weekend.